In approaching today's topic, I'm reminded of a great quote from Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty, there's no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> Today I want us to look for a moment or two at uh, what's going on in our world. I know in the 10 or 15, 20 minutes that we have, we're not going to get very deep into it. But I want to offer my perspective. One of the challenges of being a Unitarian Universalist minister and not having a creed or a set of doctrine to keep repeating and honing and bringing up every Sunday is to try to look at the world as it is, understand something of human history, and try to discern what's going on. So as to offer some ideas and perspectives to those in the congregations they serve. So I want to look at what it means to live in a multi-religious and a post-religious world. Now those may sound contradictory to begin with, but let's get some understandings clear. Religion is a set of ideas, a set of truths, a set of teachings, blended and linked to a set of behavior made possible by an institutional form. Religions have come up in human, humankind ever since consciousness. Beyond the nuclear family to the clan, there was the elder who spoke of things that no one knew anything about and imagined for the common psyche and the common consciousness what life was about. They had wisdom, they had insight. Maybe they had some special skills. I don't know. But in the world today, it's hard to look at that magic time, that time of fantasy in the way, way distant ages where people saw spirits and human-like powers controlling things. Religion is a set of ideas, a code of behavior, and a group and an organization and a ritual and an institution to perpetuate it. There are different forms of religion, of course. The Western are the main three, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Judaism being the oldest, Christianity next to Islam. And those are monotheistic religions as we know. They see the movement or the ideal uh, of power in the universe as a superhuman, a great personality that has all the characteristics of the human personality. Kindness, jealousy, greed, fear, anger. They're projected on that understanding of the power beyond their own lives. And I would tell you that those religions are becoming more brittle. They're becoming more fearful. They're becoming less pliable. Once upon a time, Christianity had the great power of going into a new area, and sometimes with a rough hand and sometimes with a gentle hand, but explaining the metaphors, explaining the symbolism, explaining the meanings of Christianity to these new people by utilizing what they found with those people they went to. So they took on the aboriginals' concepts, brought the Christian theologies to it, and provided us with some kind of train of thought. Well, 500, 600 years ago, culminating in 50, 80 years ago, maybe the splitting of the atom, I don't know, Copernicus, Galileo, the new sciences, made those old religions really difficult to sustain their power. Because people who were looking for meanings and understandings and also to participate in the power of life found new tools and new vehicles and new ways of engaging life. 500 years ago, the understandings we had of medical science were just silly for the most part. And we go and look at about every example of the human experience to see how we've progressed from a pre-scientific world to a post-scientific world. So the multi-religions of the world are expressed in different forms, but they're in the old bottles. They're in the old systems, trying to come to grips with a modern post-nuclear world. How do we do that? Where was God, our, our Jewish friends, have loved to understand and agonize and try to understand? Where was God in the Holocaust? 
Where was God in the scientific labs that helped us create the destructive powers that we have we can use? Where was the good of life in all of this? It seems to me that human beings have moved from a dependency on a God and a system, systems of understanding that put some restraints, oh boy, they were tough-handed, but some restraints on human hubris and human, human powers for destruction. Somehow we had a sin base. We had an understanding, hey guy, there are always implications. You're going to pay for that problem. You're going to pay for that hurt. You're going to pay for that abuse. You're going to, ru you're going to rue the day you did that. Because there's, there's a justice in the universe. There's a God watching to you. There's a reckoning day. Well, what's happened with that? Is that understanding even there today? No, it's not. No, it's not. All you got to do is look at the examples of the world. ISIS, some weird form of Islam, is going about basically either blackmailing the West or just doing it for their own meanness destroying all the artifacts of antiquity in their region. Now that's cool stuff. You've got to respect the terrorism of that. That's brilliant. Because what they're saying is, we hate everything about your civilization. And to show that, we will destroy all the gifts you think are so fine. Because our dependency is an all-powerful all God who's going to make us superior in the world. It's all con convoluted. It's all hysterical. And it's all sad because it turns out to be about the notion of fear and how we overcome that fear by having a God, having a power that can overcome our fear and give us a little peace of mind for a while. A little peace of mind for a while. Isn't that a sad way to spend this wonderful miracle we have called life? That those powers in the corporate boardrooms today, those powers in Congress, those powers out of, outside the world directing the policies that we have to live by and live under are about protecting what we have and producing more of it. When we have no notion of how we lift one another up and give meaning to people's lives that are beyond the consumer that we are. Human beings are meant to be co-creators and co-sustainers with a life that's fragile. And just because we can consume more and have jobs, new jobs, every week doesn't mean squat if there's not meaning in life, if there's not purposefulness in life, if it's not for a greater good. Well, it's about time we ended poverty. It's about time we solve that problem. It's about time we understand that we can apply the science and the skills that we have as human beings to deal with the pollution, deal with food pollution, and deal, deal with all the problems we have in humanity. Where is the will? Where is the religious faith? The beliefs, the ideas, the behavior, the systems that say we've got to do that. Where's that found? Is it found in the Vatican? Salt Lake City? Mecca? Where is it found? We as Unitarian Universalists have an opportunity to be post-religious in the best sense of it. To say, no, we don't need those forms of absolute truth that we have to buy into. We don't even need necessarily those unfamiliar and unreasonable and unconscionable met mood, uh, ideas of ethics to get by. And we don't need systems that betray us by saying you have to be this way, you have to be that way. We have to be available to be courageous enough to look at the problems we have in our lives personally and as a world community and say, we can do something about that. What do you think? What can we do next? Can we decide that we as consumers can just eat so much? We can have so many toys? We can have so many playthings? That usually you just need a pillow in the bed, you know? And something to keep the rain out. Something to keep you warm and moderately cool. Human beings are great talented animals just nearly gone crazy right now, guys. We're just going to tear this thing up. Seven generations, the Native Americans said. Seven generations out we need to be thinking about. What's the implications of everything from pollution to consumerism to abuse to one another? 
How many spirits can be beaten down? How many spirits can grow up in a ghetto? How many spirits can be grow up in a ghetto of poverty or a ghetto of afflu affluence? And a soul survive that. How many different ways can we starve our souls? Physically and emotionally. I look at the characters we say and we somehow portray. I don't know. I don't say it. But that are our lights and our teachers and our, and our dignitaries and our celebrities in culture. How many are worth killing? The clothes I wear, how beautiful I am, how physically beautiful I am. How smart I am, how I figured out how to rook somebody out of something that I really don't need. How I can work without, how I can make money without producing anything. How I can serve my vanity and my greed without producing anything for the common good. That's what we emulate. That's what we say we like in this culture. It's a small wonder the world around us looks at us with such horror. While they envy us, they hate us. We have all this affluence. We have all these possibilities. And what are we doing with it? Our politicians are having us eat one another alive by these policies and these programs and these program ideas that they have that don't mean squat. It's a woman's choice who she, what she does with her body and her life and her reproductive. It's an individual's choice of what their gender identity is and who they are in their soul. When was it that we had to be soul and ma manipulators and, and, and maladjusters in this culture? Who said, you have the power to control me? You have the power to tell me who I am. Do You have the power to tell me what I can't do. If I'm not hurting anyone, if I'm producing, if I'm providing for the common good, how about us getting together and figuring out how we're going to make this thing work in this world? Amen. <laughs> now let's not get started now. We have multiple religions, multiple religions in this world that offer people a set of ideas, an ethic, and a, and, and a system in the join. And they will always be there. They will change complexions. They will change a little bit that. But you cannot, as Jesus said, put new wine in old wineskins. There has to be new expressions. There has to be a different way to be in the world. And I think Unitarian Universalists, we people in this room, a small little light in the big thing, but we have other colleagues out there. We have other uh, folks that think like we do and feel like we do that can be bridges in this possibility. Bridges between the world of fantasy and inadequacy because those old faith prescriptions are inadequate. If you've got a church with all its power, with all its uh, position, and you're saying that the world has to, that the, the, a, a woman has to have every child that a sperm egg is fertilized then something's wrong that is that is an end game that will not work and that's not the role of the religion and faith that Jesus that I understand prophesied he said be loving agents one to another lift one another up not to be molesters in the bedroom or not to be deciders about what a sexual sexuality means for this person or that person let nature work that out it's not a job for you or anybody else to determine that so we have these systems of power that have the truth that folks will come and continue to come year after year and go away and be dissatisfied and we have what we have today. Are we any better off than we were 100 years ago? Are we any better off than we were 50 years ago? Are the fears less? Look at what we've been able to do. We've been able to do our cell phones. We've got all kinds of toys. We can communicate with the, world, with the universe. The question is, do we have anything to say? <laughs> Give me a new truth. Give me a new truth that's better than love your enemy. Give me a new truth that's better do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Give me a truth that can serve humanity that's better than the old words. See, we just ignore them. And we have people living right now in grandeur and in splendid isolation and alienation. We have a younger generation under 40 that's struggling what to do because they're smart. We educated them well. We had them look at the world and basically what they see, they're either copping out like we did, most of us in this room, but not finished the revolution, or they just are so, so carrying such a load of depression and trying to push through it because all the stuff that has been given to them to say is a value, they can't see it. 
They don't understand it. So they stay close with their children. They try to get some dignity out of their lives. So they try to come claim some measure of sanity in their being and their becoming. But where's the inspiring message? Where's the lifting voice that says, hey guys, we got an opportunity here. Guess what? California's about to go bankrupt with water. How do we fix that? We do something about it. We look at our practices. We look at the way we do things. We say we can change. We can care enough about this common life and what our children inherit to be different than we have been in the past. It seems like it's three steps forward and two steps back. Three steps forward and two steps back. You've heard me rant about it before, but I'll do it again for a minute. Those guys and gals who survived that greatest generation of World War II, so all the ugliness, all the, all the loss, all the violence, all the destruction that came out of that. Europe was torn up. Japan was torn up. The world was flat on its back except Kansas and Tennessee and Oregon. It was a miserable place to be. And in my lifetime and most of the lifetime, we've come back. And those places are blossoming again. Now what was the energy that brought back that back? It was our inspiration, but it was also our caring. Where did we lose track? When did, when did we turn around this road of greed and selfishness? When did that happen? When somewhere along the line, we decided that we had to have stuff to be happy. Those people out of World War II, they did not have to have stuff to be happy. They just had to have one another. They just had to have a hope in their children. They didn't have to have a bigger toy. A better toy. They just had to have four, three square meals a day and a roof. Now, I'm not saying you can go back to that stuff, but at some point we've got to put some values in what we talk about. And thank goodness the Unitarian Universalists and our seven principles have that. The inherent worth, dignity of every person. The spiritual journey is a spiritual path that's for everybody. It's a dem dem democratic issue. You've got to figure out what speaks to you. If you want to talk about a God that touches you in your, in your dreams, that's fine with me. If you want to talk about a mechanism in the universe that's somehow out there and it's described by this and that, that's fine with me. I want to see what you produce. I want to see how you treat me. I want to see how you drive out here on Fowler. <laughs> I want to see if you'll sign up and give somebody your heart when you die. Because someone did with me. I want to see if you're worthy of the nature that is human beings. And we have an opportunity to do that every day. Living in, a, living in a world of lots of religions and no religion, we have an opportunity to be something else. We have an opportunity to be a caring people that will sustain this community and other communities like it to be able to say the things I've said this morning, for you to hear them and wonder about them. And to be mad some of the time and be happy some of the time. Be honest all the time and hopeful most of the time. That sounds like a Joel Osteen quote. I better quit. <laughs> it just makes me crazy. Between cynical and depressed, I don't know what to be. And my eyes are going into the great. <laughs> be good to yourselves this week. Be gentle with the world. It needs all the goodwill we can bring to it. Find opportunities to express and live compassion. Be good because it's a good thing to do. Not because you have to. It's just a good thing to do.